pandemic got us into a reflective space and made us look inward to see what we can do for the world at large. As a self-expression coach, I became a catalyst for women and started Vani, a one-on-one coaching program for women on finding their voice, to speak up, to be visible. As a storyteller, I spotted that there were many ordinary people amongst us leading extraordinary lives, making a difference to the world, and they needed to be heard. Thus was born You and I with Rashmi Shetty, where amazing personal journeys with their uniqueness and individuality are showcased. A reaffirmation of the fact that Open your eyes wider. The world is far more beautiful when we acknowledge the presence of both you and I. Our guest today is Geeta Ramanujan. Besides being an internationally renowned storyteller, she's an educator, academician and administrator. The executive director of Kathalaya Trust that she established in 1998 is the culmination of her vision and wisdom. Geeta also founded Kathalaya's International Academy of Storytelling, the only credible and globally recognized academy for storytelling in the world with affiliations to USA, Scotland and Sweden. She has completed 187 batches of her certified beginners and diploma courses and has trained over 99,495 adults so far. Geeta Ramanujam is an Ashoka fellow and has widely traveled to 48 countries and 27 states in India to establish storytelling as a tool of learning and also to set up centers. Geeta has also performed and trained people at the Scottish Storytelling Center, UK, Norway, Germany, Japan, Singapore, Thailand, South Africa, Austria, Greece, Istanbul, Sweden, Poland, USA, Sri Lanka and Brazil to name a few. She is also the Indian coordinator for the International Storytelling Network RIC. besides being the indian coordinator for the indian storytelling network geeta has several awards to her credit including the recent international award for the best storyteller at the bocado storytelling festival in brazil and the governor's award in tamil nadu for the best story narrator she has won the bangalore hero award twice and was recently honored by prime minister narendra modi in his man ki baat program Geeta uses storytelling as an effective educational and cultural tool in training for parents, teachers, NGOs and corporate sectors both in India and globally. Geeta is also a consultant in education and is on the board of several educational institutions and storytelling centers both in India and abroad. Listen in as she shares her amazing journey on how she became the master storyteller. India is proud of. Such a pleasure honor to have you on you and I with Rashmi Shetty in Bangalore Geeta Ramanujam Kathalaya storytelling and the art itself go so much together like hands to a glove and to have you on this podcast is truly an honor. Welcome to you and I with Rashmi Shetty. Thank you so much Rashmi. I think uh... it's been a long time and i'm so glad that we were finally able to connect now and so happy to have uh, this platform to express my journey of storytelling thank you so much for inviting me to your channel you with us thank you so much ma'am completely an honor now before we get to geeta ramanujam the storyteller who's made the craft and art i would love to know what little geeta was like because you're always somebody <laughs> i noticed with energy so full of positivity spreading cheer happiness was little geeta also like that yes and no at home i was a little quiet because i was the oldest in the family uh, so i think i was made to feel very responsible uh, for the other younger ones but uh, not really i would say because uh, both my parents were quite broad minded and we were in bombay and we lived in apartments where uh, 
two or three buildings faced each other and there would be at least a minimum of 50 children on the ground uh, every evening. Thanks to uh, no technology, I think um, uh, going to school, coming back, um, and then just uh, dropping the bag and uh, running down to play. You know, the first, uh, the, anything that was on my mind was just playing. And uh, I just enjoyed playing so much uh, that despite the fights and despite my mother warning uh, us that we should come back home by 6 o'clock in the evening, I remember I was very good with uh, putting up tiles, you know, the seven tiles game. And I was an expert at putting that last tile. So from my uh, team, they'll say, come on, Gita, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And I can hear my mother's footsteps, you know, uh, my, what my mother is going to do. Because in those days, there was no child rights, human rights and all that. So, but I was least bothered because for me, the most important thing was to keep that tile right on top. And once I kept that, you know, there was the sense of joy. And all of us shouting, and then one putt from my mother at the back. And, you know, she used to, you know, screw my ears and say, how many times I've told you? I told you you must come back and it's a shloka time or whatever it is. But, you know, it didn't bother me at all. And I think um, I could also say that uh, I've never seen my father lose his temper ever in my life. And always uh, both my parents had a smile. Especially when guests came home, they always said we were such a happy family. All the people saying namaste and welcoming. We all used to come to the door and welcome whoever comes to the family. So I think um, both my parents always had a smile. So um, I, I always thought that happiness is something so beautiful. And so this joy and happiness, I wouldn't give up for anything in my life. So even if I was sad, I used to cry it out, finish and immediately pick up, pick up my threads from where I left, and I would go back forgetting everything. So I never carried anything, I think, from my childhood. And that's probably one of the reasons why I think energy gets stored, because you're not carrying a heavy baggage, especially you're not carrying a baggage of envy, jealousy, anger, or revenge, and hatred. So I, was, I, I felt that I had this trait from my childhood, to be like the river that flowed, despite the stone, despite the house, despite the tree, going around it and towards the ocean to join. So that's how I would describe myself. Oh my God, this is such a beautiful visual because I can actually see you uh, just completely immersed in that joy of being together, doing that and still delicately balancing because the last style needs to be delicately kept. Otherwise, the whole balance is lost. So in life, metaphorically, when we take that balance, where and how did the storyteller emerge? And how did you craft that into such a beautiful art, uh, which today is something which is part of every training program? And being a storyteller is the biggest, biggest plus for any anyone, facilitator or otherwise. Yes. Uh, I think one other thing that uh, uh, I, I should... Uh, give credit uh, to my, my parents is uh, uh, both my parents told me stories. Uh, my mother would tell me uh, a proverb in the morning before I went to school and she would leave me uh, pondering about it till I came back in the evening and uh, uh, she would uh, tell it in Tamil. That was my mother tongue. And uh, in, in Bombay, the second language was uh, Hindi and the third language Marathi. First language was English. So my mother was very particular that I also speak the Tamil language. So she would speak to me in Tamil. And uh, she would uh, be very strict, but she would say, uh, don't be like that housefly, like that E that forgot its name or something like that. And then I'll be left pondering about why did that housefly forget its name? And then when I returned from school in the evening, she would be in such a good mood that she would regale the whole story to me in Tamil. Kora kora kandre kandrin taaye taaye nodaya vodayin kail kole kole chittum kodiye kodi valarum kula me kula tinir kum koke koko pidi kum meene meen pidi kum valaya valayin kail chatti chatti pidi kum koyvan koyvan tarum manne 
மண்மேல் வளரும் புல்லே புல்லை திங்கும் குதிரையே என் பேர் என்ன நான் அஃப்கோர்ஸ் ஐ ஆல்சோ ஸ்டேட் அட் அவர் பிகாஸ் ஐ டின் அண்டர்ஸ்டாண்ட் எனி திங் தட் யூ ட்ரான்ஸ்லேட் டு மீன் இன் குட் தமிழ் தட் இஸ் அ கொலோக்கியல் லாங்குவேஜ் that uh, this house fly went to the calf went from the calf to the cow like that and she would ask me where did it go next where did it go next and that way she was very sure that i was following the story and um, i think i learned a lot of things one is mainly the language and also i was wondering uh, at this uh, flow of uh, tamil that my mother was so good at and i still uh, recall i used to imagine the house fly going to the calf and the cow and the and a cuckoo that is a crane and all that so when you know vividly i could pictureize all the and i had a good memory i think it you it was so well stored in my memory at that time i still remember even the my mother saree what she was wearing when she told me the story and my father used to tell us stories from in the english language he was very fond of history and uh, historical figures so i think most of my history i learned from my father told me the story of uh, julius caesar or napoleon and uh, told told us how he would enact a bit and you know tell us the stories you to brutus then fall caesar and all that and uh, so they were great storytellers i think with whom i grew up and uh, they used to take me to a lot of movies a very nice social gathering uh, again i would say thank god there was no technology there was this one big radio at home so we were taken out on weekends and and uh, either for a family get together or a friend or a movie or a restaurant and you know i used to come back and emote the characters of the movies and they also used to take me to discourses because they were very fond of uh, uh, listening to these discourses in temples and in other azad maidan and things like that so i remember i used to come back and imitate uh, chimyananda saying ego and egos and rig desires like that so i didn't know what was ego and what was ego centric but i used to emote them so well so i think i had that trait from the time i was young so i became the young entertainer for my family so any time they saw a movie they come and say why don't you imitate why don't you uh, talk like say asha parekar but the miss kahi ka and all that so <laughs> so i i think that uh, i developed as a young child and then uh, of course uh, i grew up and a lot of things happened and uh, i got married and and i had a child and then the first job was in a school and so my natural flavor was to use stories to make uh, uh, you know things interesting sometimes i would create a story especially i remember in valley school when i joined valley school and i had 45 minutes bus ride and all the children would uh, reserve seats for me because they wanted to hear a story and whatever i saw the way i used to create the stories and tell them till the bus reached the valley school and uh, so i was the english and social science teacher there so i told them a lot through stories but unfortunately everyone cannot appreciate because when you go away from the norm people don't like it too much so very conservative teachers who thought that's not the way to teach history and they all uh, ki- kind of uh, conjured uh, among themselves they probably wanted me out of the school also but the director was quite a visionary i would say and he often saw me using the library because that was one more thing i owe it to my dad and to my mom that they got us so many books the reading became a part of like brushing our teeth it was so uh, i used to go to the library very often and so they decided to make me the librarian well uh, i didn't react to it i just responded i said okay i will and then their children were not reading and so when when uh, uh, you know they used to take books like war and peace and and huge classics and return it in a day and i know that you know no genius even however uh, uh, you know intelligent you are you can't finish the book in a day so i thought how do i inculcate the reading habit in them and i thought the best way is to tell a story and so it was in the valley school library one day in 1996 that i started telling them a story and as i was telling them the story a very important part like he walked and walked and walked and he went into the deep dark woods it was a silent night and uh, 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 he opened the door and tongue the bell would go and then they'll say what happened next 
then I say, if you read from first page 38, you'll get the rest of the story from Wuthering Heights or from Mill on the Floor, so whatever classic. And they'd all rush for that book. So it was one of those instances when one famous uh, person, Girish Kanan, and I think his cousin, they had come uh, to the library and she was watching and she said, what a lovely way to uh, make children read. And she said, let's have one summer camp. Uh, this time we will have, call it storytelling. And no, no, none of us had heard of that word for a long time. We didn't even know it was storytelling. So I think that was the first time it kind of got coined. And we announced the workshop in the city. And I think it was a one week workshop, uh, one day legends, one day epics, like with an activity. The last day I kept for fables actually. And I told them the story of once upon a time there was a lion and I roared like a lion. Mm, the lion was very angry and hungry, like, you know. And then there was this little mouse and this little mouse came and said, oh, how can I help you? You know, and so I did it with the voice modulations. And then uh, the last, in the end, when the, the, the mouse bites the net and uh, then the lion comes out and holds the mouse. And the mouse said, but you said you won't eat me. And the lion says, no, you're my friend. You know, and uh, can I play hide and seek every day with you? Yeah, sure. So I changed the voice like this. And then finally, of course, they lived happily. Children were very happy and they left. The parents were waiting outside. And one of them was from the media, uh, one parent. So he was, I think, from Times of India. And I didn't know it then. I said bye to the children. And the next day there was a column in the newspaper saying EAO sounds coming from a room. If you want to know who this is, it's a storyteller in action. And her name is Geeta Ramanujam. And this is her contact number. And at that time we had a landline, so double six eight nine eight five six. And there was a lady, this is Destiny. There was a lady who was a principal of about five schools in Madurai. She was passing by Bangalore and she was here to buy Montessori materials. And she reads this paper and she felt, feels, what a lovely idea. And she calls uh, me on the phone and she says, are you Geeta Ramanujava? Yeah. See, I have 300 teachers in the school. I want you to come and train all of them in the art of storytelling. And I said, oh my God. And so I had to rethink about my career about my whole thing. I was quite content in the library. It was not that I was not happy. Then I thought there's a new door opening. And so two more teachers joined me and they said, we'll be with you. I went to the director and I said, I think I'm going to start a storytelling organization. And we invested whatever salary we had, which was hardly 1,500 to 2,000. We all three pulled in and we said, let's call it Kathalaya the House of Stories. And that's how in 1996, the whole journey began. And every step of that journey, I've had stories. And at every step of the journey that I took, every step has a story. Every step had a destiny. Every step I thought was a written script. Because if I have climbed 25 years of my steps today, I owe it all to, the, to whoever is about to nature and to all those people who have supported me and I feel that uh, it's a lovely recipe where you put in your effort and your passion and the world you know kind of comes together to make it work for you and it's been such a wonderful journey I can't tell you I've traveled to 48 countries in the world taking the storytelling on my wings flying with it wherever I went 27 states in India, varied people. I don't think anybody has had a luckier life than I have had, where my passion and the profession, you know, work together. And I still feel when I tell a story today, that it's the first time I'm telling a story. Beautiful. Where passion and profession get together, somewhere you find your purpose as well. And ma'am, the way yeah. you told us your story now, it's fascinating how life has its way of placing the dots exactly where they need to be and putting you through yeah. the When 
you started storytelling and the workshop and you decided to start Kathalaya. Yeah. Were there no doubts, no questions as what am I going to do after this workshop? Because it was that workshop that started or triggered it for you. And you left the job that you had, invested everything into starting Kathalaya. How were you? There was no social media per se, like how we have today. So how was the word going to spread? You had one word, big workshop on hand. How were you intending to take this forward? Yeah, it was not easy at all. Uh, we had to print uh, things for which I used to travel all the way to cotton bed, choose the paper on which we have to print. I've gone in the mornings, early mornings, uh, to places where they used to put pamphlets in the newspapers. And I used to get these pamphlets printed because we had to spread the word that we are storytellers. Uh, I even went to a very popular person today who is very, very popular as a storyteller and a story writer. She had her organization right up uh, road in Banargata. But even she was not very, uh, she said, what storytelling are you doing? If you want, you know, you can give books for the poor people, but uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, so it was not easy to uh, ask people to give something because storytelling was not measurable. If we would ask someone that we wanted to paint a classroom or paint, uh, 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 give the clothes to the children, then they, they knew that it was measurable. So for so many uniforms, so much donation. But donation for telling stories was not very easy to get. And it was a new field. So nobody understood what it was. The schools, they said our teachers are good storytellers. So, and every time I almost like kind of thought this is the end and we can't continue further because we also need funds. We had someone or the other, one beautiful soul who would come forward and say, I'll help you. And this happened at every stage in life. So first we got from India Foundation for Arts. He said, I'll give you five lakhs for a year. And you take the storytelling to five schools. Try it out. And I can fund you only for one year. But see how you can sustain yourself. Now the problem was, I didn't have time to know, think about how to sustain myself. Because we were busy spending that money and going to schools and doing all this. So we had to invent new strategies. So we discovered a lot of things, you know, man. Necessity is always a mother of invention, right? So we started thinking, okay, let's uh, do one thing in schools. If they don't want to give a regular storytelling period, then we will take them out on uh, stories on wheels. We invented that. That is, we'll take them out for a trip. We'll call it, call it uh, out of classroom experience. We'll teach them. We'll ask them to do a project. For instance, take them to Kokarebelu. Talk to them about birds and actually have, have them to see and to project and to, you know, learn about uh, what are the different types of birds that come there. And so explain what are the uh, migratory birds, how are the wings, what is the wingspan, and make a project and display it for the parents and teachers to see. So these are things, strategies that we had to come up with, for which the people were ready to pay because it was one, one more trip outside and, you know, like, then uh, we used to do also trips for one company called Bosch. At that time, they wanted us to take the people out for cultural tours, especially those who are coming from Germany. Now, the payment was very good. At that time, we needed money and we had made it a trust. So we used to take them out to Mysore and other places. And there we used to give them little booklets on what all uh, you find along the way. What is a, a, a you know, ge geological setup of Ramnagaram? Or why, do, why are the rocks over here? Why is it rocky here? All those things. So it was interesting. Every time we had to learn, we had to new. So right from beginning, we had to think of strategies, and, but not give up. Someone never felt I should give this up. I always felt it can be adopted. It can be adapted. But somehow reached the goal of integrating concepts with stories in learning and education. That was the main motto. But spread it all over uh, else. Because I had to, we had to get money for the funnel. And so one more uh, trust that Tata Trust came forward that we will uh, fund you for training programs. Can you do 27 training programs in Chhattisgarh, uh, Kodaikanal tribals and reach out to uh, women who are not having this facility, 
and empower them so that in their anganwadis their schools they can take so their uh, thank god i was equipped with many languages so i used to do it in the local language and that is one more way that i started traveling i started doing so there was no time to uh, to wait and to reflect at all whether i i'm i i'm doing the writing or not whether you have thing customizing it writing down and that those days you have to write proposals there was no social media connect nothing so we had to like um, you know if if at all we had to have a public event it was quite a problem we had to go to the newspapers of course and tell them write a column and give it to the editor and say can you just announce this for us like you know and uh, so that's when we came up with the, uh, the 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 idea of a festival actually and also the idea that came up was at the academy of storytelling because i thought children were always ready to listen to stories but the children can't pay the elders have to pay the elders are not ready to give you money for storytelling so how do we get money so i thought if we convince the older people that it's important for to teaching them how to fish then rather than giving them a fish that is when the academy came up in mind and by the time one very beautiful hearted soul i have always had these beautiful souls coming from different places to to kind of i think it, it was in the air so this man called bill drayton he was in the ashoka foundation office in washington and he decided to give an ashoka fellowship only one person from one country would be given then and imagine i was selected from india to to so he he helped me with a stipend for 3 years to carry the storytelling only clause was it should be replicable okay so like this we you know we got funds and we we we, we were only trying to uh, balance between this bag and that bag you know innovation uh, adapting storytelling to different situations filling the bag with money so that it can be rotated for other purposes so it was quite uh, sleeping at 2 in the morning and getting up at 4 in the morning just 2 hours of sleep and then the house you know so many things thank god my child had grown up by that time so she was able to manage a little bit and uh, though i i always also decided i'll never carry any guilt in my mind i was not, never a person as i said only as a happy person so whatever within my thing i could provide for her i did whatever i could provide for the house but i never carried any guilt i said i like to do what i'm doing and the step taken forward i said i will not retrace it back this attitude i had and continued and continued and and then i think we uh, finally the academy was uh, we had an office in 2003 we had the first academy course and at that time i had to go to us for some reason again for a marriage but i uh, automatically stumbled upon a person who runs a storytelling organization he decided to fund us again he told that he will pay for the first festival and for he give us affiliation for our academy just imagine so i gave him the academy notes he said it's wonderful just start i'm there to support you so you know it it was such a wonderful thing that he brought, he sent up affiliation certificate from us and my certificate right from the first course had affiliated to the united states and you know here in india if you have something from abroad it is more recognized so that brought us the first recognition because otherwise storytelling was uh, viewed very frivolously but first time people started opening their eyes and said okay so there is storytelling which is an art and it has to be learned and we have to know the techniques you know things like that so uh, the same year 2005 we had the first international festival it went into the limca book of records and i think that was another eye opener for storytelling and so on and so forth slowly people started calling us from around the world and from around india and so that there is no place i don't think i have not set foot upon uh, right from the himalayas to to kanyakumari uh in the south in india and from the west uh gujarat to east uh, tripura where i go every year i go to many places abroad every year we have even set up we have set up about 18 storytelling space centers uh learning centers including one in ireland and one in bogota in uh, 
Columbia. And now looking back, I think, how did it all happen? <laughs> <laughs> how did it all happen? It started with an intent that was so pure and mainly to convert that craft into an art. Now, uh, just taking that step back, ma'am, which you're anyway in now reflecting on this entire journey, when you look back, do you or can you point exactly that moment where you realize that when you were telling the children the story, you were doing it instinctively. It was not that you got them together, thought of a plan. You were just trying to, your intent was getting them to read. So it was, uh, storytelling was a medium. And then you moved in to train teachers. And again, storytelling was a medium. When did it actually turn into an art? I think uh, when I started doing workshops, and men, mainly when I set up the academy, uh, I, and I decided to call it an international academy for storytelling because there was no academy in the world. It was all attached to universities like oral communication like that. But nowhere there is an academy for storytelling which certifies people in the art of storytelling. After I started, there, now there are a few, but not at that time when I began. And uh, the person in US, he was so happy that I was starting, I was beginning because there are festivals all over the world, but there are no academy like which. So when then people started asking me questions, oh, is it an art? And do we have to learn? And what is there for three days of seven? First, I used to have it as one week course. For one week, you are teaching us about storytelling. And slowly and slowly, as people attended and went back with a transformed feeling and that there is so much depth because it's not only about storytelling it's about life it's about uh, journeys it is about uh, passion um it's a little bit of psychology it it has folklore uh, it has tracing our roots it is about the belief and faith uh, and you know connecting to the cosmic world it's about different philosophies of storytelling around the world. So it has everything in this course. So everyone who attended the course, they said, we thought it was only a course on storytelling. But this is a course of a lifetime. And so that, I think, added to that bag, you know, that, that this is not story. It's just the, the surface, the cream of the cake. But the cake actually contains everything of life on which the cream is the storytelling. So you, for whether it's public speaking, whether it is confidence, you know, and clarity and speaking the truth, speaking with integrity, everything I used to tell them that story is the base for everything. So I started using it as a base to build these little castles, you know. And that is what I think the people started uh, recognizing. Of course, there are all kinds of people in the world and people for a long time just loved it. They were mesmerized by it. And then some of them wanted to take their own. They saw meaning in this profession. And they said, we will become storytellers professional storytellers. So I also opened up diploma courses. And then now I also have the train the trainer. So you see, all these courses help people to see that storytelling can be an art. Storytelling can be a viable profession. So I said, you know, you, you decide. Because everything is not free of charge. Every art has to have its value. So today, storytellers can earn much more than even uh, a software engineer, if they have, if they work at it, and if there is, there, there is that uh, thing. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to say I'm earning. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in this profession for too long, because there is a heart, but there's also this. Today we have to live in this world, and there are no free lunches. So I, I also thought I'll give it that uh, lift that this can be also looked at in a business angle. So 
So storytelling as a business, as a professional, storytelling for giving, for reaching out. So I had little tributaries made, you know, so that storytelling becomes just a tool and that it could be taken for many other. So I think my academy was the starting point when people started opening their eyes. To realize, yes. Sometimes the, now I'm sure people find it very normal and really very, uh, not very surprising when you call storytelling an art. Because today, exactly. storytelling is something that they need in corporates a lot for sales, for negotiation, personal branding. Everything is around. Everything. Yes. And uh, curating a story together is what the art is all about as Indians and in most countries. The cultural background that we come from, the folklore that you mentioned, most of it was passed on orally and stories were a huge way to connect the next generation to what happened. So storytelling is ingrained in human beings right from the time he started with the smoke signals to communication. And uh, when a person wants to know whether I can be a good storyteller. What are some of the qualities that you think a good storyteller needs to have? What should he be conscious of? All of us are storytellers, but what is a good storyteller conscious or aware of? I think it's a mixture of things. For some people, you just need to ha have one little saffron to make that paisam or that skir, uh, give it that one taste, right? So some people are like that. They already have it in them. And when I do the course or when I tell them that you can and just put this little saffron, then they bloom. Some of them, they don't even have the basic milk or the basic sugar. They don't know the recipe at all. But they are willing to try. They want to know. It is out of curiosity. Then what I would say is they come Either they reject saying this is not my cup of tea or because of their interest in it, they say, I will and I want to build this up. So just like, you know, you need uh, uh, time uh, for, for to go from one step to the other step. Some people take that time, but they are very sure of reaching because of their passion and interest. So interest, I would say, is one of the most important things that you are convinced that this is what I want to do. Okay, this is, I want to tell a story. Should be the, the, the first main thing. Uh, because qualities can be taught. The, the art can be taught. But first of all, you should have the interest. That I want to be, I want to tell a story. Uh, if, it is, if you start with a business uh, uh, mind, that how much money can I make, then it's not going to work. Because then, and then, you also, most of us have the herd mentality that I want to be spoon fed, that I want to uh, be exactly like that other person because we all look up at role models. And then I try to do something which is not my cup of tea. Like I can't make sounds, for instance. And then all your life you're struggling to make the sounds, right? So one thing I always tell in my courses is use your strength. If you're good with music, so this storytelling is such a beautiful feat that if you're a good musician, you can integrate it with the, uh, story and make that interesting. If you're good with painting, you can you can paint a story and you can you know. So it's so beautiful because you want to tell a story somehow. So use your mediums, use your props, yeah. But tell your story, yeah. So for each person, what ma mainly matters is that you should want to be a storyteller and you should have a lot of patience because this is a service oriented field. It is not going to give you immediately, I sell a sari, I get 1,500 on my hand. It's a, it's a slow build-up. You can't climb uh, Mount Everest in a day. You'll have to climb it slowly. It's very experiential in nature. So if I'm made for that, then this is a wonderful feat. Yeah. So I think this is the most important ingredient uh, and mainly the belief that you have. And I think... Uh, Basic, if I have to tell you, is I think when a person doesn't have too much of ego uh, and too much of like uh, only steeped in their own thoughts and always self-centered, it doesn't work. Because this is a very giving field. You want to share, you want to give. 
and your happiness comes when you give, when you share. Do you have that mentality to share and give? Money will follow. But basically, do I love to see the smile on somebody's face? Do I love to you know, see somebody being healed? Then I think this is a good thing. Yeah. So uh, all this goes to uh, being, for instance, uh, recently, uh, I've been doing my talks on storytelling. I've been called as speaker. And um, one of the conferences that I was speaking, as usual, I spoke with a lot of passion on what is storytelling. A lot of audience and everything was fine. And one man, I think he was looking for an answer. And he just suddenly stopped and he thought he found his answer through my story. And the next thing I knew is three months down the line, he's been calling the office and he fixed a meeting with us. He came with his team and he said, I've decided, ma'am, to, to start schools in Katalia's name because he was so convincing that I'm going to start schools in Hyderabad and I'm going to call it Katalia Kids and Katalia International Schools. And I said, are you sure? And he said, I am beyond doubt sure. Now, this is a belief I'm telling you about. And I didn't check. I didn't uh, think. I just went along with that flow because he called me to his office in Badarahi. And now we've already got the first building. It's all painted. It's done. It's everything. Admissions are open. And he's starting four pre-primary schools in Hyderabad. So, so just look at that, you know. If you didn't have that belief, and he said everything should be based on storytelling pedagogy. Now, here is a total stranger who just because of the interest and belief and passion uh, takes a step in saying, I will start Katalia School with storytelling as a pedagogical tool. What better gift can one get uh, than, you know, uh, feeling that storytelling has to be part of education. For the last 25 years, I've been doing this. And today I got the answer for that. Wow. This podcast is called a human library podcast because each one of us are walking, talking storybooks and oh. just taking pics and little bit of chapter extracts of each one's lives that we can cover. We see how much each one of us is as story. So now that you're in that reflective space and that happy space that you found yourself a couple of steps back for the last three years, almost now, the world took a completely different turn and look at life because the pandemic made us look at everything we have with gratitude and made us understand how little is enough for all that we are thinking not enough. All of us went into reflective spaces, the perils of losing those lessons. Yes, when life is getting back to normal, maybe, maybe not. But how was right. it different for you, ma'am? What did the pandemic give you? And Absolutely. did it change anything? Uh, I think the first question you asked is, uh, uh, ma'am, did you look at how uh, you will go forward with the workshop? Uh, then, and I told you, I replied saying, I didn't have time, yeah. right? I just went on and on and on. Uh, now the uh, pandemic was uh, like after a long journey of a thousand miles, uh, driving on that highway, there's one small cow that passes by and you realize that there's something called a brake. And then you put on the brake, right? And when you put that brake and you look at that cow actually passing and you sit and that's the first time you look at the mountains around and you're uh, sitting in that car and you say, here I'm sitting, I've been driving this car for the past 25 years. And I haven't even known where the clutch is or the, where the brake is. And that is exactly what happened to me. Uh, because though it was a beautiful journey, I just realized that I have had no time to reflect, to contemplate, to look at myself. And that was something I relished. Uh, because I uh, surprisingly... I was not afraid. I was not afraid at all. And I only thanked God. I said, it's your way of telling us, listen, stop, think, and reflect. And it gave me so much time for the first time to read, to reflect, and to think, what am I doing? You know, besides that, 
also when people started demanding i was totally against technology and here i could learn a new art and uh, offered my courses online i realized that people from egypt and australia and usa were able to join the course because i offered it online so you see everything has a good a plus and a minus so much so that even today people though i have opened it again offline they are requesting me if i can please do it online also yeah so uh, everything that i was afraid of in one sense afraid of technology and always saying that it can never be as good as the offline i had to swallow some of my words because i could see that people were so happy from these distant places and even from some parts of india where little kids and they said I, we don't know how to thank the covid because we are able to see you at least online so i think the online also gave a different perspective uh, to 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 looking both at myself and to also look at something which is anithyam one is i i know that i always talk about uh, impermanence but i actually felt that impermanence and that again i owe it to my dad who always said accept so i said let me accept the situation and not ask questions what if it continues forever what if this is the norm of the day what what if this becomes the the, the main thing okay continue okay but when it opened again i said okay thank you god again but again opening it offline and we, we never know what the future holds for us but i i decided i'm going to live more in the moment uh from the th- pandemic and not break my head about the future or regret any past many people say if only i had come across this course when i was 20 i tell them no you had to come across it now and that's what happened so we are all in this time which commands us you know we are in this wheel of life and as long as the wheel is turning and taking you and you are meeting the right person at the right time we have to be very grateful to god and grateful to that nature and i pray always that give me the strength to keep looking at it positively and not negatively so that is what happened in the covid time wow and talking about positivity i'm sure awards galore must have come your way is there any special moment that you cherish and which tells you that yes i have found my purpose i think many moments when uh, i was recognized every time i wanted to give it up and i i said enough i think we have to close the gates uh, the first time was when the ashoka fellowship came and then a grant came my way and all that but as you age and you grow up with the organization you also find a little uh, bit of stagnancy so what am i doing training and workshops and things like that but the what the good thing that also happened is um, there was someone in the himalayas who said why don't you have a course here before that i have had courses in delhi and pune and tripura and uh, all those but when uh, when he said himalayas i was very thrilled um i could explore the himalayas i could go for treks and so i thought this was a beautiful opening so i still run courses there i do two courses in a year at the himalayas and i really look forward to it because that's a motivation for me um it has it is a call and i just love watching those peaks from there you know and so that one thing that uh, helps boost me in continuing what i'm doing and uh, when i travel abroad it's uh, i wouldn't say it's the best i know that many storytellers there they appreciate they like and the people clap and everything but i went to one bocado a storytelling festival thousand audience and uh, there was a translator actually and there were about uh, i think 25 to 30 international storytellers and after all that when they announced that they going to give one of the best narrators award uh, to geeta ramanujam from india i was thrilled 
because I said, Mao, out of all to be recognized as a world storyteller and one of the best world storytellers was a great moment for me. So that was one I always cherish. And uh, the other one which I love is uh, when uh, Modi ji called and I didn't recognize. I, I thought it was a fake call. And uh, it was from his office and, and he said, uh, I'm speaking to Gita ji. He said, I'm, and he said, I'm going to mention you in Man Ki Baat program. And he wanted to just check whether katalia.org is the right website and whether my name is Gita Ramanujan. And imagine getting a call from a prime minister, whoever it is, you know, to get a call and say, recognize you and mention you in his monkey bath program was uh, like the feather in the cap for me. And I was so thrilled and I was so happy. And even though it was just about... Uh, three and a half minutes, he put my picture and he put the organization's name and it gave me a great recognition and gave me a boost to carry on what I'm doing. I think these are moments that I, I, I love when, you know, uh, somebody says you're doing great work and motivate you to, you know, carry on what you're doing. Especially when you go down and you say, okay, it's enough. I think I've done enough and uh, what more to do, and that's when some, something will open up like that. So these moments, I think, I, I cherish a lot. And for people like you who constantly get these moments in life, uh, what have <laughs> been some three uh, life lessons that you'd like to leave us with? One mainly is uh, things happen. I'm not saying leave everything to karma and faith. You put your effort, you do your best. And leave the rest to, no, I'm not saying only God, there are nature, nature. Krishnamurti uh, always says, uh, Jay Krishnamurti, a great philosopher, he says, when you throw yourself into the laps of nature, that is your nature, it has an astonishing way of taking care of you. You know, you can never fight nature. Nature is large. The universe is large. In cosmos, that Carl Sagan says, when you look from the universe, we are a pale blue dot. That's what the earth is. And imagine inside that dot, there is one Gita Ramanujam sitting somewhere in Bangalore. Where, how much of that dot will you break further? And we are actually inside that dot. Why are we thinking we are the universe? So, you, I'm not saying have a low self-esteem of yourself. I'm saying, remember that in this vastness of the world, everything passes. So one, another thing I would say is, I know it's very easy to say, but I've also had difficulties. I've also broken down and cried. I've also lost hopes in life, but accept everything that comes passes. One a very important lesson is good, bad, COVID, no COVID, it all passes. So we are all in that passing phase, which may look very fearful. But every day what we eat, we excrete. And that's the truth of life. So I can't say yesterday I had meal dosa, so today I don't want to eat. You have to eat something, right? Because every day you have to eat in order to live, to survive. And that is life. So accept whatever comes your way and keep letting it, let it pass by you. Don't get attached to anything. Because everything is impermanent. That's the truth of life. And we are all in that movement. We are all in that movement. So that is one thing. So nothing is going to last forever. Okay, so today you are interviewing me, I'm answering you. I don't know, 50 years from now, who's going to listen? But that's not, that's how, not why we are doing this interview today. We are doing it because this moment we feel it's an important moment in our lives, in our time. Right? So I think if, if, we, if we do that, what is expected for that moment and live in it completely at the moment, I think we've done great for ourselves. Okay? And uh, the third, I would say, never carry any guilt of the past. Never ever make anyone feel that you were wrong, you could have, you should have, and if only you had not done that, if only you had done that. 
because there will always be fingers to point up, whether it's from your family or from your friends or, you know, there are always people ready to clap. But just have your own confidence and say, you are, I am important to myself. I care for myself and I am capable. Only you can give yourself that boost. Actually, there is no other. We are born alone, we are going to die alone. But, and the pain, you are going to suffer. But imagine we are all alone in our own ways and we are all together in that aloneness. So I think these would be the most important things that I might want to leave behind. Powerful, simple, profound, all put together. This is Geeta Ramaraj. It's such an honor speaking to you because a storyteller has always fascinated the world. They make simple things look beautiful. They make beautiful things completely memorable. And the power of a storyteller is in how you use your words, your body language, and everything nature has blessed you to make you aware of the moment. And coming back to that pale blue dot that we are all part of. Thank you for contributing your bit into the universe to make that matter. Honored to have wow. you on You and I with Rashmi Shetty. God bless you. Continue to inspire and stay blessed. Thank you, Rashmi. Thank you so much. I always leave people with it's the listener's energy and the person who comes up with the question sitting on the other side who makes the teller speak. So you were also responsible for whatever I spoke today. And if I've given you the answers that you wanted, it was all because of you, your heart, and your soul. And I'm so glad to be connected with you. Thank you so much. Completely agree, ma'am. I can't believe this conversation had to wait 10 years. <laughs> but I'm glad it happened. Like you said, it's the moment, and this is the moment that I'm going to cherish for a long, long time. Thank you so very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. With that, we come to the end of this weekly quest of You and I with Rashmi Shetty. Do let us know if you know people who make the world beautiful. Write in to rashmi.thethirdi at gmail.com. That is R A S H M I dot T H E T H I R D. E Y E at gmail.com. Come, let's explore this amazing world together, both you and I.